Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, get morning. this meeting started. We have a long meeting today with lots of interesting things. So, um, and I just warn everyone in advance, um, we had a little glitch in getting our stuff out to us early. So we'll be going in a little bit of a slower pace to give everybody time to sort of catch up as we do it. But that's really mostly for us sitting up here. Um, so uh, if everybody will turn their cell phones off and um, we will entertain a motion to uh, approve the agenda. Madam Chairman, uh, Madam Chair, um, I make a motion we approve today's agenda of um, January 13th, 2022. Great, thank you very much. Is there a second? Seven. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, there are none. The agenda is approved. <clears throat> Uh, we'll move now to um, communications and public response. We just have one speaker that has asked to speak. Uh, that's Bridget Thorne. If you'll approach the podium, you have two minutes. Hello. According to the state auditor report, Bolton has leaned heavily upon an army of temporary workers to fulfill the litany of tasks that must be completed from logistics to processing ballots to scanning final results. It would perhaps be best to offset this number of workers with stakeholders from the community who would like to get involved in the electoral process. By conducting multiple interviews with temporary staff, it was made clear that some have no keen interest in participating in this immensely important process, which is perhaps to blame for some of the sloppy clerical errors and logistical shortcomings that have plagued the complicated electoral process. So why? Why are you continuing to use temp workers? Richard Barron doesn't know who these temp agencies hire. It's immensely important that we know who Michael Harrison and Tony Dozier hire. They are handling our precious votes. Let's be hypothetical. A temp worker in English Street making $15 an hour is approached by someone offering him $10 for every blank absentee ballot he brings him. The temp worker sees 400 blank ballots packaged that belong to precinct JC13. These should work. The manager at JC13 on election day receives 400 photocopied sample ballots with a cover sheet and a rubber band around them saying JC13, 400. She sends a clerk to the English Street Warehouse to find her missing ballots. The clerk is told they don't have any absentee ballots here in English Street. The manager reports her missing ballots. She is fired. Months later, it's reported that Deputy Director Dwight Brower ordered millions of extra absentee ballots just in case they couldn't use the machines. After the election, they shred that $300,000 worth of ballots. Where are these ballots? Where were they on election day? Where are JC13's ballots? Could this happen? Absolutely, under the current system. You see, the use of temp agency allows anyone to slip in and out of our election process Thank undetected. You. We want a system that's easy to vote and hard to cheat, not easy to cheat and hard to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. The, we're moving on to old business. Um, I think we're all uh, appro uh, reviewing the minutes right now. Um, Doctor, did you have a motion you wanted to make relative to these? My motion is that we table this for uh, our next meeting to approve these minutes and give us enough time to review them. Is there a second? Second. Probably, second. probably moved and seconded. Um, is it appropriate for me to ask a question? I just want to make sure with the law department, it's okay if we delay the approval of minutes till the next meeting. Is it okay if we approve the minutes at the next meeting? Okay. I just wanted to make sure we're doing the procedure properly. Okay, properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed, uh, there are none. We will approve this packet of minutes at the next meeting when we've had time to review them thoroughly. Um, uh, Mr. Barron, do you wanna give us the uh, operations report for December? Yes, good morning, everyone. This is the December monthly operations report we finished the equipment pickup for the November 30th runoff election 
and the staff is currently completing post-election supply sorting inventory and reconciliation. Polling locations for all 2022 election dates have been reserved. The polling locations for 2022 are being confirmed with plans to present change proposals at the next BRE meeting in February. And these will also include change proposals due to redistricting. We will use all nine check-in locations uh, for the May 2022 election that we have been using. Those reservations are being confirmed. We have at this meeting today, we will ask the BRE to approve advanced voting locations, dates and hours for the May 2022 primary, as well as the absentee drop boxes. We'll, is all, those are also on the agenda today. Election officer positions have been filled. Both are set to start this month. And moving on to voter registration. In 2021, we received 96,045 voter registration applications, um, including 5,461 applications in December. Those are received via Department of Driver Services online voter registration portal with the SOS, applications from third party vendors and applications mailed or dropped off at our office. As of December 31st, we had 851,089 registered voters, 70, 757,702 of those are active. We just mailed out on uh, early, earlier this month, 55,563 NCOA, uh, National Change of Address notices to voters, and they have a 40 days in which to respond. The clock began on January 4th. Um, those are all people that um, are indicated that they have moved. And I think um, we have some voter challenges today and probably some of the challenges that are before that will be before us today on an item will also uh, are included, I think, in this mailing that just went out. We had a challenge hearing in December of 66 electors. Today, we have, there will be 593 electors uh, challenged from three different individuals. You can see also in the front desk operations, <clears throat> um, the number of visits, we're, we're tracking the number of visits uh, to the disk for yellow tickets. And just an example, we did uh, temporary, those TVIC, applications to make temporary voter ID cards. There were 66 of those, and that we had 33 walk-ins reg registering to vote, amongst others. In the admin division, we, you can see that re currently we have several vacancies, including registration chief, some of the registration officer positions. We will, we're recruiting the registration chief position this month, as well as for the registration officers. Um, we're reposting an absentee officer position. We will um, also start recruiting this month the administrative manager position. That one is not currently vacant, but it is, it is an existing position. And then you can see it for admin coordinator one, some of the positions in the warehouse, election systems assistant supervisor and systems specialist, those have already been filled as well as the admin coordinator and the election officer positions. So those five were filled. Preparing for the 2022 primary, qualifying fees were submitted for BOC approval at their regular meeting last week. The qualifying period for the May primary is March 7th through the 11th. And then we will uh, be submitting those, uh, the fees to be published in the legal organ no later than February 1st, 2022. And we have attached in your board packet the qualifying fee notice. For the budgets for 2022, we, the, there are three budgets that were that the county has decided to fund the general primary the general election and a general election runoff they did not fund a general primary runoff which is um, somewhat surprising but we will 
probably have to use the general runoff funds for the general primary runoff. And then if there is a general runoff in the fall, have to go back to the commissioners to uh, seek more funding. We asked for 13 new positions. The commissioners asked us to reduce our reliance on um, supplemental staff. And so we, we identified 13 positions that we could keep busy in a 40 hour, um, for, for 40 hours a week and over a two year cycle. And those, the county is not going to fund those positions that we asked for. So we will still have the same number of full-time positions in 2022 that we did for 2021. Also, the, there are several equipment requests that we made that are not going to be funded. We wanted to be able to have enough equipment so that we had an inventory for early voting inventory for election day and an inventory for training. Um, what this will force us to do again is to have to turn over a lot of equipment on the weekend before election day. And that forces us to deliver a lot of equipment the day before the election rather than the week before the election. Um, we are managing and tracking invoices and balances of staffing expenses against the budget. Um, managing and tracking invoices for rental of poll, poll facilities um, as far as the election budgets for, or for 2021, managing and tracking and reporting procurement activities that require a purchase order and submitting invoices received to accounts payable uh, timely. Also on December 31st, the campaign contribution disclosure report and the campaign com contribution disclosure final report and termination statement or exemption affidavits, they were due on, at the end of the year. There was a five day grace period ending on January 7th. With regard to voter education and outreach, the VEO team spent December planning for the 2022 cycle. They also had some events in December, but they have many events scheduled uh, beginning in February and We'll be using both, both of our mobile buses for many of those events. They have partnered with Disability Link to host a series of voter education events for constituents with disabilities. They, uh, LaShondra Little, the VEO manager, has also uh, been meeting with commissioners and continues to meet with commissioners for what they would like to see with voter education and outreach. And she has also been working with external affairs and FGTV to develop collateral for voter education and outreach team to help enhance the department's brand and footprint. Um, the VEO team is working with the Latin American Association and plans to host the first all Spanish speaking voter education and outreach event in January. Deputy registrar training has been revamped, it will now be a hybrid approach of online and in person, CIDL has developed the online training for the department. The VEO, VEO team will continue to conduct in-person and group training. The next, the next deputy registrar training is on January 17th. And the VEO team is also reaching out to every municipality in Fulton County, the schools, communities, nonprofit organizations, and government officials regarding scheduling future events. The, in the absentee division, normally at this time of year, we, will, we would mail out voter or absentee ballot applications to those that are 65 and older or disabled. And people that used to get those from us at the beginning of the year need to uh, be aware that we, we, due to SB 202, we're unable to mail those anymore. It's not legally permissible. Therefore, they need to, anyone who is used to getting those every year, they need to apply for an absentee by mail ballot or um, either online if the SOS gets their portal open or uh, via downloading an application and mailing it in to us. And that is it for the operations report. Um, 
either myself or staff can answer any questions on the specific areas covered in the operations report. Why don't we start uh, with Ms. Crawford and just work our way down. I'll, I'll go last. We'll jump over me and I'll, I'll pick up whatever hasn't happened. Um, the question I have, uh, Rick, is I've heard that the uh, state is changing the software or the program to uh, um, check voters. Has that is that happening? To check in voters? Yeah. Um, I'm unaware. I, I haven't heard anything about that. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Somebody had mentioned it to me, and I hadn't heard, so I thought I would ask. Will you make sure your mic oh, is right in front sorry. of your face? I know somebody, you. Somebody had mentioned it to me, and I thought I would just double check and ask. So thank you. Is that all? Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Dr. Ruth? So uh, I'm looking at the personnel vacancies and new positions. So there's quite a few vacancies and just wanted to get your thoughts, the department's thoughts about how you will be recruiting um, for these positions. I see that there are some that have been interviewed, selections have been made, but there uh, are a number of, of um, positions that could impact you know, the, the process if, if we don't get these fields. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that. <clears throat> we are um, looking to have all of these filled this month so that we can, we can close all of these recruitments. We have had to repost um, two of the positions, with eight of the positions, we're having to repost the positions just either for lack of um, interest in the positions or we need to find some people that are more qualified for them. Um, and that would be in registration officer, absentee officer, the people <coughs> that have done the interviews in that, um, which would be either Mariska, Shamira, or Patrick could probably comment on those individual interviews for the, in the registration and absentee officer positions. The posting for registration chief is already I believe, is Brent, did that go out already? No. Oh, it's supposed to go out this week. So um, we can, but our goal is to have this all done by the end of January. And I think that we, we can definitely at least have all of them filled and have everyone starting in February. Okay, and um, can you tell me about logistics? What role um, will any of these titles like logistics play? have that as a primary responsibility. You're talking about like equipment delivery and those? Yes. The, okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, the election systems assistant supervisor, the election system specialist, those, uh, those positions prepare the equipment in the warehouse. So they don't necessarily, are, are not necessarily involved in the delivery, but they get the equipment ready for that. None of these positions that are here actually are a part of that. The person that arranges the deliveries is uh, John Ross in the warehouse. He is the one that schedules all the, in the deliveries for to, to all of the polling places and arranges, coordinates when the equipment is going to be delivered and, and schedules the couriers to make those deliveries. And are we using a, a moving company still, or what's the idea? What's the idea around getting the equipment? We the we only use a moving company if if it's necessary. If we have too many deliveries to make, um, on, for example, on the Monday between, but we've last year uh, for the November and December elections, Dream helped us, the Department of Real Estate and Asset Management which is a county department. Um, in 2020, we did use a delivery company to help us in some, some aspects of this, but it's, this is mostly done internally. Okay, um, I just know in the, in the past that there have been glitches with logistics as far as getting equipment to precincts in a timely manner. So I, I think it's important to really focus on that and um, have a plan for making sure precincts have what they need. 
Um, I do have a could, question. Could I yeah. just ask a related mm -hmm. question yeah. to that? Is some of that that, that Dr. Ruth has just mentioned meant to be addressed by the additional equipment that we've requested from the Board of Commissioners to fund? That would that would help, yes. I mean, we, we have to prepare. <clears throat> base, what happens now is all the early voting equipment that comes in, if we have 30 sites, that is, we bring that back on Friday night. That all has to be turned around and for delivery on Monday. And it, it takes a lot of labor and a lot of time to get all of that ready. So we've had to push more and more um, because since this new voting system, we've had to push more and more polling sites to Monday delivery uh, in order to make that happen. And, and we, tell me how many, if, just mention how many machines that, that is. Roughly. On, roughly, it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of, it's probably in the neighborhood of, um, what, 300 to 500? Do you know, Dominic? 500. And so they have to be basically wiped clean and then, or what? Tested. We have to go through all, the acceptance testing has to be done. After they come back in, we have to, we have to LNA. close them out and then, and then do all the testing on that weekend. That's something we never had to do before. We now have to do that simultaneously with preparing the poll pads. <coughs> and when you have uh, the poll pads as it is right now, those take, depending on, on the bulk file and any updates that have to be done, um, the iOS updates, those take a minimum of 12 hours, but have taken up to 30 hours to prepare. And a lot of that has to do <clears throat> with, and that's why last year we added access points in the warehouse. We added a cash box. We've moved the cash box to a different part of the warehouse. Um, and it did improve, but we also didn't prepare as many no ink pull, or pull pads for the November and December, or I guess both of them were November elections, this in 2020 or 2021. We didn't prepare as many of those. Once when you're preparing 800 versus 1300, it just adds, but Dominic has done a lot of um, experimentation with finding the sweet spot of how many pull pads to pre prepare at one time because it, you can you can line them all up and do it but it may take so long if they're all hitting the access points at once that it's not worth it's going to take longer to have them all set up at once but right now we just don't have the warehouse space either we're having to use two warehouse send things back and forth a number of things affect the way things get a number of things affect how quickly we can get the poll pads done. And it can be the, the number of carriers that are in the warehouse. They somehow interfere with the oh, Wi-Fi no. signal. <clears throat> and so that slows down the bulk file update. <clears throat> and so until we get into election central, that process is not gonna speed up. Can I ask one more question yep. related to it? So the requirements that are making this more difficult for us are those requirements because of the new machinery that we are using and or requirements that are based on legislation that's passed we, or something like that? Like what, what is making... We were given a certain amount of equipment. Um, we used a lot, of, we used grant funds last year to per, or in 2020 to purchase more equipment. But our early voting program is so large that um, we don't have enough equipment to send all of that out to early voting. And then we don't have enough equipment for election day or for training. So as, as early voting goes on and they're preparing for election day, we have to start pulling equipment from the training classes in order to get ready for election day. And then all of that early voting equipment is needed for election day. So then we have to bring all of that in and turn it over. Our, what we want is to have our early voting inventory separate so that we don't have to, to do any of that turnover. We then have to bring in more people on the weekend before that are not as familiar with all of our operations just to be able to now run parallel prep for the poll pads and turning over the early voting equipment. 
it's, it's just taking much more, it takes much more um, manpower and time to do those preparations and we don't have a, as much space because we don't have a GWCC this year or we won't have one in 2022 either. That's the Georgia World Congress Center. Right. Those spaces are unavailable. And so we're still going to, at least for the May, the May primary and the June election, run things back and forth between the EPC and Hapeville. Okay, thank you. Apologize for interrupting oh, no, you, but no, I just no, thought I'd no jump problem. in. No problem. It was a good conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so with the, so you need a larger space, right? Which Election Central will solve, yes. But we don't have that. We no, and I don't anticipate. It, do you think we're going to have it this year at all? It doesn't look like it. Yeah, I don't think we're going to have it this year. And the BOC has not approved. Um, funding for addition, to buy additional equipment, or where is that? No, they have not. Um, that was something that I, <clears throat> I, I think I gave everyone the, all of that information last month at the December meeting, um, not only for, with regard to the equipment, but also for the personnel that we requested. So is, is it possible that um, you, the department can work with a logistics company. I, I think we need to see a, a, a concrete kind of proposal for prepara logistics preparation for um, the primary. I mean, this is all eyes are on Georgia, regardless of whether or not all, all eyes are on Georgia. We want to be efficient. We want to be able to um, deliver equipment in a timely manner because it affects the way our elections run. Um, so I would ask that you all, that the department would provide the board with a proposal for the handling of the logistics. Can I just make a statement mm -hmm. related yeah. to that? I mean, I feel like the, the proposal is that we purchase the additional equipment so that in a timely manner, all of this can be done. Can you just, again, thumbnail, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. What, what is the amount of that request? The equipment, um, I believe there's, there's two requests, the one for about 2.4 million and another one for about 500,000. Um, okay. And then on top of that, the carriers that would go with it. And that's another, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 to 500,000. I'd have to look at that again. Okay. And, and that, then do you need to purchase another cash, more cash box? No, the, ca the cash box and the access points, we have the warehouse covered. Okay. Problem is that we have so much equipment in the warehouse now, and we, if we have, when we're preparing the pole pads, if we have, if we're turning over all of that equipment on the weekend before, and we have all those carriers in there, it interferes not only with the space we have to prepare the pole pads, but it also interferes with the, the metal of the carriers interferes with the bulk file update. It slows it down. Rick, do we still have all of the old DREs in storage? No. Are they no. all gone? They're go yeah, they, yeah, we, I think that was in January of 2020 was when they finally picked the rest of those up. Would somebody yeah. please say what a DRE is? Those were the, those were the electronic voting touch screens that we used before this system. Okay. But remember, we have, we have people watching. I want to make sure everybody's following the conversation. I don't know. <laughs> Those are the questions. Sorry. All right, Dr. Ruth, next question. Um, I think we got Darren Savannah, I think. Yeah. Go, did you need to say, were you going to comment? No, she, Nadine thought there might be the sequestered ones from the federal court might be at the warehouse, but I think those were picked up and taken to Savannah. That you think they're in the warehouse? Oh, there, oh, there, there are central maintenance facility possibly. I don't know if the state, I think the state picked those up, but we would have them at central, they would be at central maintenance if they, if the state didn't pick those ones up. And then I, my last question at the moment is regarding the deputy registrars. Um, how many do we have or how many are? Shamira.
Good morning. Good morning. So the certification <clears throat> starts over every year. So as of now, we, we have to do the recruitment. So we finished last year with 60 deputy registers and the previous year is about 175. Okay, and how are they used, these, these registrars? They're used to assist us when we're doing voter registration drives or if they are wanting to hold registration drives themselves. And so you will have um, a couple of deputy registers that, are, that will reach out to us and say they want to conduct a drive in their community. And so we assist them in being able to put those drives on. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> That's all I have for right now. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, heretofore, we, uh, in registrations, we were provided a number of those that are actually from the applications that are new voters. And I don't see that on this particular report. Is that, was that in some other attachment <coughs> that I'm not looking at? Uh. This to me, and I can't quote it, but it looks to me to be the old. In the past, there was a call. There was a column that said they were new voters that were there were new applicants. Um, yeah. I don't have prior information sitting here, but we did have a line as it was that okay. indicated the. Uh, yeah, Shamira will add that. She okay. said she changed the format or didn't hold. Yeah. It's just okay, like Holly had changed the format last month, so okay. Shamira will change it back. Fair enough, thank you. <clears throat> um, standard operating procedures. I read here where uh, the registration division completed 22 updates, I guess along various lines. Um, could those updated procedures be uh, uh, given or supplied to the board, please? Yes. Yeah, well, I can have Shamira email them. Okay. We can get that as soon as we possibly can. Be appreciated. Thank you. Um, Thirty-three million dollars for this year, uh, as the proposed budget. Given everything that you believe, you know, guessing or otherwise, um, is that a realistic budget number? <clears throat> You mean, is that enough? If we, well, if we have four elections. Too much, too little, right on, you know. I think, well, based on, we, we, we use these numbers based on 2020. So um, I think if we have three elections, this should be enough. If we have a fourth election, then, um, you know, we, we try to come in under budget on these, so. Um, it could be right now the reason why they funded three and not four up, up front is because they are hoping that we will have some savings in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> it's just, it is much more expensive. I mean, it's probably three times, the, the budgets have gone up essentially 300% um, for the, the elections budgets with the advent of this voting system. Mr. Wingate, may I ask a clarifying question sure. on top of yours? So the um, election budget of $33 million is for the c conduct of the three elections you mentioned, but mm -hmm. that doesn't include our regular operations and no. some of these additional requests. So what is the total budget it's over thir It's just over $38 million. Is that right, Ms. Janelle? Yeah. Yeah, it's just over $38 million. And that the, Our operations budget is, is right around, is a little over $5 million. Okay. And then that doesn't include the things that aren't funded that we're still concerned about. Is that correct? Correct. So the 3.5 for the uh, basic hard equipment. Um, did we, okay, did we get the annual maintenance list? Uh, list yeah, that, all, everything on the annual maintenance is, is squared away. Okay. Yes. And then travel and training. We just didn't even bother to submit that. No, we submitted it. It wasn't submitted for yeah. approval. We had, our, our travel and training budget is the same right now as it was when we had 18 staff, and now we have 45. And we, so we, we submitted this year an increase. 
Um, but yeah, no, that wasn't recommended for for approval or for funding. Okay. Are there any certifications that people won't receive this year as a result of that? Um, and you can answer me later. I, know, I realize yeah. I'm asking you for detail, but most uh, most staff has they tried to go to become a certified elections registration um, administrator through election center. So it, it limits the number of people that can attend that along with the state annual state conferences. And usually we can have one or two people um, attend a CIRA, the CIRA training. Okay, let's have a conversation. We can do this offline because it's not that particular, but I just want to make sure that everybody has the ability to get certifications they need this year. You know, and saying no to that is just not an answer. It's kind of like the equipment stuff. It's just, you know, you just can't not do that. Um, and then the capital projects on the vehicles, you just don't know what the status of that is. Nadine, have you heard back on the, on the vehicle requests? We still, no, no. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt No, you. no, that's fine. Uh, in terms of those that uh, you have either not put forward for budget approval uh, in a way, shape, or form, roughly how much more would that be if you got everything you were looking for? I think everything we asked for totaled, uh, including the, the 13 positions. Right. Um, it was somewhere, it was just over 5 million, I believe. Plus five, okay. Okay. I think all the equipment and the accessories that went along with that was somewhere in the neighborhood of three and a half million. That is not inclusive if, in fact, you were uh, able to have the additional um, BMDs funded? That would include, would yeah, that include. would include that, yeah. Okay, so the five million does, is inclusive. Okay. Yeah. Please say what a BMD is. Ballot marking device. Thank you. Mark, can I piggyback on you real quick? I'll have to, I'll, next time I'll bring a uh, vocabulary. <laughs> Um, I just have a question, one quick question. Uh, Mark had re requested uh, the, the SOP for the absentee ballots. Um, we have not received the, any of the SOPs. So if you could shoot us all of your SOPs that sure. you have taken care of right now, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, we can do that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, well, not up to the grandma. Madam Chair, I'm going to leave it at that for me right now, thank you. Okay. Mr. Johnson. Good morning. Uh, a couple questions. I want to follow up on the budget for the election. So, because I know for educated fact, we're going to have a primary runoff with so many people running in, especially in the statewide races. Yes. I'm not so much thoughtful on the uh, local elections, the county, but I know, I feel like with the statewide elections, we are going to have a runoff, which would require us to have a countywide election. Correct. Do you think the potential savings, because at that point, we would only have savings from one election, mm -hmm. the general, I mean, the general primary election, would that be enough to cover? We will have to transfer the budget for the general runoff, which would if, if there's a runoff in the fall and and make that the budget for the primary runoff. And then come back mid-year potentially. Yes. Okay. Um, also redistricting maps. One of the things that I keep hearing about is there's a potential that the primary, and I'm not sure if you've heard it, the primary may be moved back because the counties are scrambling to get their maps together. Is that an issue that we're having in Fulton? The, well, one thing that I will say, uh, we, we had a meeting with GIS. There are a lot of lines, the state, the, the state's lines. Um, we had, the way Fulton County's precincts lines run is that they will, they might, they'll run up a street. So one side of the street or the other are maybe in different districts. A lot of the state lines when Kwok sent, uh, the GIS staff sent us, there are 
state lines that are running through neighborhoods, but they're running right through homes. They're splitting the homes in half and they don't match up with the county lines. So there's gonna be um, some work that needs to be done to adjust those lines. Now she indicated that it seemed like the, what, what's the name of that office? The, re, the reapportionment office kind of indicated to us in an email that we have to follow their lines. But a lot of them are splitting homes in two. So I'm, between our GIS office and the reapportionment office, I think that we need to figure out where those lines are gonna land. I've, I heard what you heard that the primary could get pushed back just because of, but as of now, there's nothing concrete. Oh, absolutely, definitely you wanna go with the dates that are there. But, um, and I don't know this, have the additional lines already been taken care of? I know the state lines, the congressional lines, but I know they also have to do county commission, city council, one of the uh, council member uh, actually, our mayor, I'm sorry, reached out and he was concerned that there wasn't going to be enough time for people to determine if they're going to run or not because city lines have not been drawn yet or not been... Uh, oh, like the precinct lines haven't been withdrawn. Well, I think now the plan well, is... The city council, no, city council. And I'm asking, have they? I could be wrong, but his concern was they don't know exactly what the lines are for city council seats. Or is that, should that be the case? Unless Nadine knows differently from, I don't believe, I mean, we, we haven't received any information that those lines have been completed. Correct. No. They still have not, that you know of. Right. Okay. Because that was one of the major concerns with some of the elected officials is that while the state elected officials know about where their lines are going to be, some of the ones that are running for county commission or city council, and please correct me if I'm wrong, they haven't been done yet. So some people who live like right on the line and say district, and I'm just making this up, they live in district one, but they live right on the line. Their district could change and they're now in district two. So they're trying to prepare for elections that they're not sure what the lines are. And I know that's gonna affect us as well. Yeah. I know. When yeah. would you need to have that specified date-wise uh, since qualifying starts March 7th? What was that about? When would you need to have um, that qualified, uh, that date set um, for, for, for you, for the, for the Board of Elections to run the elections uh, to be ready for the qualifying on March 7th? The SOS deadline for reimportionment is February 18th, so we'll get all that squared away by that date. Thank okay. You. All right. That's all I have. And I think you know we can we can also forward you just an example of, of how the lines don't match up if you if you'd like to see it. Just I mean, essentially, somebody if they're in their bathroom, they're in one district, and if they're in their bedroom, they might be in another district. I mean, that's the way these lines go through a neighborhood in some instances. Mr. Wingate. Nadine, I, I, I apologize. I may have uh, not heard what you said. Uh, what is the date that ENET has to be updated for redistricting? February 18th. February 18th. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I just have a couple questions. Thanks to everybody for asking so many questions in depth because that'll make mine a little bit shorter. Just want to... Um, do one final round of math on the budget request so we can make sure everybody's kind of got it. Um, so right now, the operations budget that's the same amount of 2021 is about 5 million. Yes. The election budget is about 33, but that does not include, let's just say 10 for an additional runoff, the general primary runoff. Um, and then when you flip over the capital projects budget, what is that? Another million ish? With the oh with the trucks and the trucks and the cars and forklifts and yep. those. Mm -hmm. Do you remember uh, Brenda or Jill? 
Janelle, how many, in, what the no, amount of those were. So, now I, I think it's, I don't think it's a full million, but. Okay. But we're just going to say a million because that's how math yeah. works for me. Um, and thank you, Brenda, as you shaking your head. Then, then the uh, additional equipment that I think we all think is a, deserves serious consideration is another 3.5. Increase for food and stuff that probably is fungible at this point. And then the travel and training, I don't know what that is, but it, it looks to me like what we're probably talking about instead of a $38 million budget or a $43 million budget, we're, we're probably talking about a $53 million budget to really make sure that we have what we need, really without anything extraneous here. This is just bare bones, bare bones of what we need. So we're, you know, we're, we're, there's a little bit of a, I mean, the, the absence of the $10 million for the additional runoff yeah, you know, there's always a, that accrued savings by the time you get to the end, and then people would just have to plug it in. But I think it's a, I think it's a misnomer for people to think that we're going to run the election, you know, on a budget that is this sparse. And I think addressing the issue of the utter miracle that Dominic and the rest of the staff do over the weekend from early voting to election day, and remember, a lot of these requirements are requirements by law. We're not right. choosing to be up against a wall here. And we're trying to, you know, com we're complying with the law, and we're also trying to make sure that voters have access to vote uh, in a very crowded situation. So I just want to call that out, and I think to the extent that we can individually and as citizens communicate with the Board of Commissioners to say, look, you know, getting this additional equipment is essential for performing what we need to do. Um, and I, I always tell people it's like just the, the sheer amount of traffic that we contend with on a Friday afternoon, moving mm -hmm. things around, you know, Fulton County is enough to, you know, be a very, very difficult situation, just getting to one part of the county and back with equipment. So mm -hmm. um, I think we should drill in on this a little bit. Um, and again, I just want to thank the staff because I know the stress that y'all are under, and Dominic, the miracle <clears throat> that you have done with figuring out the technology and how to work around metal boxes that slow, again, required downloads. This isn't us making these requirements. These are requirements that, that we are doing as a result of state law and other things. Um, I, I just commend you and, and thank you for, for what you do, and we'll do everything we can to support that. Um, one last question on this issue of um, us not being able to send absentee ballots to elderly and disabled voters. The applications, yeah, the absentee yeah, ballot the app applications. Absentee yeah. Ballot, yeah, this just kind of breaks my heart. I mean, I, I, I know how challenging it is for some people who want to participate and, and the thought that you have to have a printer or a computer to, to make these applications or even know that it's not going to happen as it has happened in the past um, is a great concern to me. Is there anything that we can do, A, to make sure that these people know that there is a change in the law and they have to do something different? Um, are we doing something about that? We, we do have in, in our head of household mailing that goes out, um, which we've already had a couple meetings this year to talk about prepping for that because we've so many mailings that we're trying to combine them all into one. Uh, that reminds people that they have to apply for. Now the primary is the one election that has an exception where if you apply for the, the ballot for the primary, you will get it for the primary runoff, but that is not the case for any other election. So that that's also a way that it confuses voters when you when you include a runoff for a primary, but you don't do it for a runoff for other elections, voters get confused as to why right. they aren't, and then they get mad at the for the general runoff. They won't get a ballot automatically. They have to reapply. Is, can um, I ask one question about that? So is that a, is that a state law that does that? It's SB 202, yes. Okay, and so it's perhaps an omission. Um, I'd be generous. Uh, no, I don't believe it was an omission. I think it was just, 
uh, for whatever reason, they decided to do that for the primary, but they did, did not do it for any other type of election. Okay. I'm wondering if we couldn't ask the county to put it in their legislative package to ask that that specific addition be made. I mean, I think there's some things about, you know, we can have our political differences about Senate Bill 202, and that's not what this is about. What this is about is making sure that senior citizens and disabled people can be, can, you know, can be facilitated as, as much as we can. Well, and I um, think it's consistency also. Yeah, and the consistency. I mean, that's, the, yeah, that's the consistency confusing. part of it is the biggest. Right. Because that, for me, if you have one type of an election that has a rule one way and all the others are different, it, it does confuse yeah. voters. And we haven't, this, in November, we had, we, we got the word out that you have to reapply for the runoff, but now you're going to get, you're going to come in a big election where more people vote, and that rule is turned on its head, and then it's going to go back again the opposite way for the next one. Director, uh, for, for those people 65 or older and disabled, um, though you're prohibited from mailing an application, are you prohibited from mailing a letter explaining they need to? We are not prohibited from doing that, no. But, but you are doing that, right? Or not? A letter, well, we do a head of household mailing. Um, and so we have one, one piece of mail that goes to every, every household in the county. And that will tell everyone you have to, you have to apply for an absentee ballot. Uh, Apple, but for every election, we won't. We'll do it again before November. So, I don't want to confuse things. I'll, we'll tell them in this email, this mailing. If you apply for the for the general primary, you'll get something for the general primary runoff. We'll have to then give them the opposite message when it comes to the general election. If there's a general runoff. Okay. Just out of curiosity, how much is the mailing? Does a mailing like that cost us? Well, that's what we're right now. Right now, we have to do the head, we're doing the head of household mailing. We've got the redistricting precinct cards that will go out. What were the other ones? Oh, precinct location changes. There's like three mailings. We're trying to consolidate them into one. So we've we've asked the state for permission to put the precinct cards into the same um, envelope with the head of household mailing so that we don't have to just keep mailing yeah, yeah. different different things to the voters. Yeah. Um, and, and somewhere, I believe, around 350000 to to do that mailing. To do each one or all three of them? That would be for, well, that that is to do the, the head of household mailing is usually around 350000 Okay, that's right. If we know. can combine it, the postage may go up a little bit if we have two or three things in that envelope, but... Okay, because um, that would be um, information that I think would be valuable to if we ask to have the rule changed. Okay, Mr. Johnson, did you have something? And not to complicate it, but, and hopefully we don't, when we send this out, it's only like two or three things, because I know also if you put too much in the letter, then they read like the first, the second thing, and then not the second part. But I do think it's a great idea to have the card separate. Like you have your letter, and then you have your card in there, and that'll make them look, you know, the average person will look at both of them. But uh, if you put too many things, you know, bullet point it, make it pretty, highlight it. But if you put too many things, it'll com uh, that'll, to cut down on confusion, you may cause more confusion. Mm -hmm. That's my only suggestion. Yeah. Could I ask the uh, outreach staff to consider Figuring out if we've got some <clears throat> community partners that work with people who are senior citizens and, and people who have disabilities to, to figure out if there's some additional things that we could do uh, to be creatively focused, you know, on that audience and, and kind of repeating the messages of what they need to do. And, you know, this may not be something that is a budget thing, but, um, you know, that they might be able to to do some additional outreach that, that focuses on that singular thing. Because I know it's a, you know, I've managed this in my household right. um, for my mom. And fortunately, she's got a, a lot of 
she's got a household advocate, she's got a computer, she's got a printer, but um, it's still hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and to keep up with it is still a challenge. So um, I'll, just, I'll just leave that as a, as a suggestion, not a, not a mandate or something you have to report back, but I, I, I would love to yeah. see if we can be creative about that. And I would suggest that you reach out to the retirement homes. Um, we, we're, we're, you know, they're popping up everywhere. Um, and as far as uh, individuals going in to do registrations, because a lot of people are moving in also because their children are bringing them to Atlanta, uh, they don't have the opportunity to, unless, unless they are getting a driver's license, they don't have the opportunity to register to vote. And um, it would be better coming from the elections department <clears throat> going into those homes saying, can I set up a registration? office as opposed to a party going in and asking. But that, that also is a, um, a great place to, you know, fix, change, get the message out. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I think that, I, I oh, please go ahead. I, I do want to revisit. Um, so can you t just tell me how many early voting locations are you considering for today, on the agenda today. Oh, it's, is that in the next part? Okay, yeah. I'll save it, sorry. Again, I thank everybody for their patience. Um, th this is a big agenda today, and I hope we're not wearing you out, but uh, I appreciate the thoroughness of the discussion, and um, we'll move on from this section um, to, to the rest of the agenda, um, which your timing is impeccable, is approval of the early voting and drop box location. Ms. Williams, you want to take us through that discussion, please? Yes, good morning. Um, we are proposing 30 sites, but it actually now is 29. We were not able to confirm the High Museum of Arts, so we'll be removing that from the list today, but it was a total of 29 advanced voting locations um, that are outlined in the packet um, that was provided to the board, as well as seven um, FC drop boxes since our active voter count is under 800,000. Um, we are limited to seven absentee drop boxes, and those locations are also outlined on, in the packet. And we're seeking approval of these locations and hours listed. Um, would you just give us a thumbnail of what might be different about this from past early voting? Um, we've used, utilized every site listed on this document. Um, honestly, we are... To, to um, stay within our budget, we came up with 30 sites, but now, like I said, it's 29. But all the locations that are listed have been utilized in the past and all have had a high voter turnout for advanced voting. So they have worked well and they're as evenly distributed as we could possibly do within the county, throughout the county. And is this less or more than we've used previously, roughly? Um, it changes depending on the type of election. We will increase the number in November. Okay. For November 2020, we had 31 sites plus the two buses. So we had 30, essentially 33 sites operating per day. Okay. And then several of those sites were the really, were the mega sites, I guess, for early mm -hmm. voting last time, which we don't have use of, right? Can I, I, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. please. Um, uh, you've taken OC library <clears throat> off? Oh, no, sorry. I didn't see the R. Robert F. I got it. Okay, yes, OC yeah, Library. <laughs> Correct. Um, the only thing, I don't know if we want to replace High Museum with the Government Center, but that is a decision the board would need to make if we want to remain at 30 or reduce to 29. I think if, if, we, if the High Museum is not, uh, or is unable to participate, I think we should probably Find another come one. back to the Government Center just so we have another spot down here. Yeah. So the High Museum is out and not pending? Well, they're pending, right? I'm sorry, it's pending since we're running out of time. We just want to go ahead and replace it so we can move forward and start planning accordingly. So do you need um, any, do we need to ratify this in any way? Do we need to? We got to make a motion to make approve a motion it, to approve. but we can make a motion to approve it with the addition of the government center. Yeah, do we need to be that specific or with, with one addition in the, in the central Atlanta area? so that you guys have some flexibility? Well, we can try again with the high. Can we say the high is pending? And if it's not approved, we will um, alter, we use the government center as an alternate site. Can we do that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want. We want to give you the most amount of flexibility. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, Madam Chair, yes. I make a motion that we do just what Nadine just said. <laughs> I second that. So the motion would you got be. Got that, Jessica. So the motion would be. Now, the motion the is to approve the uh, list as written, mm -hmm. uh, including and making note that for the High Museum, if it does not work out, then we will move to the Government Center. <clears throat> yes. Okay. And second? Is there a second? Properly moved? Can we, can we change the language to the Government Center unless you're sure? Are to you what sure now? you can get the Government Center if we can't get high? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we can use the... The okay. advanced voting room, okay. or what right. used to be the AV room right. upstairs. Then I, I second it. So okay. yes, that's it. Can, can we have just a little bit more discussion? Just okay. uh, it's been, will you just withdraw your second? Well, I thought the. If it's properly moved and seconded, you have to vote on the motion. Yeah. Please. All right. So I you voted. Is it. that where you technically are supposed to discuss? It doesn't matter to me. Okay. Yeah, I withdraw my second. She'll withdraw you mean the second. former council president is right. Well, listen, that, that's 20 years of rust operating right there. So um, okay. she's properly, she's removed it, her second. And um, you want to just remove your motion? I'll remove my motion. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, remove go my ahead, motion. we'll just have discussion. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask, so you, you stated, Nadine, that we, we've, we're um, under our voting registration or ho however many voters we have is less, right? Then. Well, I was saying that the code says that we are limited to the number of um, absentee drop boxes per active voters. Mm -hmm. um, it says active, and our active count is around 740. Right. So that's why we have to stay within 700. We, we seven. We can't go to seven, eight. Seven. 700. Oh, right. Okay. And then what about, what are the requirements as far as the early voting locations per um, voters? I know what they are in the in the, um, on election day, but is, are, is there any specification? I can't remember. There is, um, there is not. The only thing I have seen is a limitation on hours and the dates that we have to pick is what the outline to us, but it's, I think it's our discretion where we want to place them. Okay. Um, and, like, and like I said, we have um, tried to evenly distribute them throughout the entire county. Okay, great. Yeah, there's no requirement on that. We usually have more sites than Gwinnett, Cobb, DeKalb, and Clayton combined. So our program is when we try to blanket the county with sites so that everyone has an opportunity. Right, and they're all handicap accessible. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, without any objection, um, Ms. Johnson, you wanna go ahead and you can summarize your motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I make a motion that we accept the early voting locations, noting that the High Museum is pending, and if that location does not work out, we move to the Fulton County Government Center. Uh, you want to second? Yeah, I want to second it, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. Let me yeah. ask the question first. <laughs> oh, no. then also, do we also have to approve the drop boxes separately? It'll be this whole package. Just the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. I second it. Okay. Properly Sorry. moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. That's approved. Thank you very much. Uh, review of the VRE bylaws. Um, We'll try to make this one as succinct as possible. The, the main reason for the review today was, I just have a copy. Okay. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, here. Somebody's gonna have to make the motion, but I'll explain, oh wait, that doesn't do it. That, just hold on to that. Um, so the main reason for the, uh, the examination of the bylaws is to let all of us who are new board members, myself included, to review the bylaws and to sign them. The last official signature of the bylaws was with um, previous board members. So this is just sort of a um, perfunctory type of thing. But one of the things that we discussed at a previous meeting was uh, giving the opportunity for public comment at our regular Thursday meetings uh, and not having public comment at special called meetings. Um, and after some discussion uh, with Mr. Wingate, uh, also during the election night meetings where we have business to conduct that um, uh, really needs that particular focus. So we can't vote on this, but I'm gonna read it so that people can hear it. And then at the next meeting, because we will have had 15 
uh, day's notice to the BRE members, we can we can vote on this officially. Mr. Johnson, do you have a copy of? Th this is the original, and I'm going to read to you the change that um, Ms. Ringer did. So we're we're looking at Article Three, Section Four. It's about public comment. Um, right now, it says each meeting, uh, and and I have inserted the word regular, uh, and then Ms. Ringer has helped clarify. Each regular meeting, except for election night and election certification meetings, so those are those two meetings that we have around elections, during which citizens may voice, and I kept the language there. This was a very long run-on sentence, so I broke it. Um, it just basically says people can come and speak at regular meetings, not election night and election certification meetings, Oh, should, should we include special meetings then in that, that sentence? Okay. Sorry, we're making sausage on the run. And Sorry, I, we, I will rewrite we, this and give this to members of the board yeah. for your consideration over the next month and then in February. So basically what we're doing is saying, as usual, you can come down here during regular meetings, give your, your comment card to Ms. Robinson or other staff member, and you can speak for your two minutes as usual. Uh, during special called meetings or our election related meetings, we will not have uh, public comment. We, don't, we usually don't anyway, but we're just we're going to establish that in the bylaws, except that there will be an opportunity if a majority of the board members are here in quorum, decide to make an exception. And during that exception, they can make limitations. So for example, if somebody came down that had to speak very specifically to something and we wanted them to, we could say, we're making a motion for public comment for person X to come and speak for two minutes on the topic of X. Um, that way, our meetings can be efficient, and um, but we'll still preserve the normal course of events that we have um, for public comment. So just so everybody knows what we're doing, what we'll do is rewrite this, distribute it um, to the BRE informally, just so that you have it with that 15 days notice, and that really sort of starts today anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the next meeting, we'll vote on it. Um, I don't know if public, if, if we should discuss that right now or not, but if people have questions or thoughts about that, if you wanna, or we can just no, move on. Whatever I don't like. have any problem. Should we just move on? Okay, thank yeah. you, Ms. Ringer. Thank you very much, and I will uh, handle that piece of it. Um, so, Ms. Robinson, if you'll put that on the agenda for next time, um, and then I'll clean this up and give it to you to put into the board packet so that it's just in the board packet. Okay? Thank you. Happy Faces presentation. Mr. Eskridge, would you like to uh, take us through that? Good morning, everyone. Um, so I guess you'll have to follow along within your packets. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you'll begin on slide two, please. Um, in the beginning with our, I'm sorry, I'll begin with our current staffing model. Um, we've projected that we need approximately 3,700 workers for a successful election cycle. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I'll, I'll come right down here if that's better. Okay. No problem. Yes, ma'am. So uh, beginning on slide two, um, this is a picture of our current staffing model. Um, we project that we, that we need uh, approximately 3,700 workers to complete a successful election cycle. Uh, we have provided the rough estimate breakdown of those 3,700 with a little over 800 that are sourced, 
or come from a temporary staffing agency. In the next several slides, I'll cover those uh, list of positions of um, the 800 that you see before you. Sorry. The majority, I'm sorry, I got to take this off. <laughs> sorry. Um, the majority of workers needed from the community are recruited for election day operations, which are our pro workers. Um, with the board approval, during last year, we were able to increase our departmental staff to 45. And below that, you can see the proportional breakdown um, where, <clears throat> excuse me, 22% come from the staffing agency, 77% or uh, three quarters come from the community and Fulton County employees. And then the 1% is comprised of uh, Fulton County <clears throat> permanent uh, full-time staff, sorry. Please note that all election workers are trained and managed by full-time Fulton County permanent staff during their term of employment. To the right is the example of how the numbers to the left are sourced. And again, in the upcoming slides, I'll go over these positions needed for the upcoming May election. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, based upon the public voice and concerns, along with the urging of the BOC, we've um, been asked to explore alternatives as a result, and we've discussed the following alternatives. The first would be to remain sourcing um, the needed staff through the current staffing model. The second is the alternative would be to work through the uh, county's HR department. I'm sorry. Second um, alternative would be to work through the county's purchasing department to solicit a new bid for staffing services. And then the third alternative would be to work with the or through the uh, county's HR department. Next slide, please. Can you just interrupt you? I apologize. Yes, ma'am. Because you can't see the slide. Sorry, thank you. Um, I'm just trying to get a clarification. We use a temporary staffing agency. How many of these people go through something like that? You're saying the, the, those that are sourced through the t staffing agency? Yes. That's the first number, a little over 800 so positions. 800 yes, positions, okay. And then the other 2,700 come through the, our department as volunteers and... Correct. Okay. Um, the community is long as well as Fulton County employees, um, based upon, la I think, not, we're in 2022 now. Um, during 2022, 2020, sorry, in the midst of COVID outbreak, um, a lot of those were being able to utilize or be taken from internal county other departments to uh, be used as poll workers. Okay, great, thank you. I'm Mr. Okay. Eskridge, yes, what is, by definition, a community employee um, that does, if it says community employee, that's what I'm, I guess what we were alluding to is our poll workers come from Fulton County's community, the community abroad. So they're not internal employees, but, um, citizens from the county. And correct me if I'm wrong, but many of those that you've defined as community actually are staffed via happy faces currently. No, sir, that is incorrect. None? That's not what he's saying. That's the first number. Mm -hmm. So it's these advanced I poll, voting but, poll workers. But <clears throat> who and how are those people then, you're calling the election day slash poll workers of 2,795? Mm -hmm. You're so saying, again, hmm? I'm sorry. So again, those applicants come from the community who have shown interest in be working for um, either election day poll poll workers. So <clears throat> we have we get a list. Um, also, the state sends over um, a regular list of community individuals who have shown interest or applied to be poll workers for the county. Directly. So that's, that's where that number comes from. But didn't we, correct me again if I'm wrong, but didn't we have in the last cycle, there were several poll workers 
of various levels that were in fact onboarded by happy faces. That was for advanced voting. Um, as we go through the presentation, I'll show, we'll cover those positions that are staffed for yeah, advanced yeah. voting. The, in, in November, uh, in 2020, sometimes we would have, the happy faces would staff security or the technicians. So they weren't uh, actually poll workers, they were, uh, or the, um, the, what do we call it, the door greeters, the line monitors. Line. Sometimes line monitors, people that would be outside directing people with poll pads, security personnel, which would be police. Okay. They, they, were, they would come from happy faces. The poll workers themselves, we received those applications and then um, our coordinators recruit them and then place them. Okay. But, but for early voting, for advanced voting, we use like- For support. advanced voting, we use a staffing agency. Yes. Okay. But we had the discussion, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but we've had the discussion that the county, you know, did not and didn't have the facility to onboard all of these people. And then there was issues in terms of time allotment, in terms of how many hours are going to be worked, and where that met federal regulation in terms of even things like potentially overtime pay, which I have noted has become an issue of whether or not there's even overtime due. So to me, part of what collectively is, it needs to be expanded here is exactly how does that work? Because depending on what agency is onboarding these folks, there's various regulations that are, have to be considered. Therefore is, you know, you may have another budget issue. Potentially. Okay. Um, I'm sort. I'm sort. Well, yeah, I am because actually, I think some of these might be answered subsequently in this mm -hmm. presentation, and and I'm apologizing I for I derailing your presentation. But I, what um, what I wanted to put in here, Mr. Wingate, is if you look at the election workers and additional hires in the 814, mm -hmm. these three sections in red relate to these three. Okay. Uh, and I just Three have codes. questions on how that was put together. That's why I'm asking the question, okay. which is valid. Okay, go right no, ahead. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm, I don't understand. Go right well, no. Okay. Listen, this, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'll, I'll leave it alone. I'll do my own work while I'm, okay. I'm no, actually, yeah. I want to make sure that we're answering the questions that you have because we're also going to make this presentation to the Board of Commissioners. And so uh, if, if this isn't clear... Um, we want to make sure that we get it clear. And, yeah, um, and, and so I stopped the conversation to make sure that we were actually just relating the information because it's not available up there. Um, but we will continue, and hopefully that will answer. But please Let's do ask the questions. Let's continue and do that. Okay. Go ahead. I, I'll, I'll just say it's not what, what we... It, it's important that we know what's needed, these poll workers, this is 3,700 total. It's important that I think it's, it's broken down by election day and advanced voting. That's, that's the issue. Okay, I think, that, I, think, I think we're gonna see it in subsequent pages. And again, our apologies, we weren't able to get the board book out due to right. a technical issue, and so we're seeing stuff for the first time. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Mr. Asker, if, if I can interrupt, just to have a, I have a comment, actually. Uh, as far as us recruiting county workers um, it, when we have a shortage on, on election day, um, is there something that we can do to start collecting names now for people that want to work the polls um, as opposed to people just getting pulled from their jobs? Yes, ma'am. And so, told that they're supposed to be somewhere at, at 5 in the morning the next day? Yes, ma'am. So... We've already begun proactively recruiting for election day. Um, before the closeout of uh, 2021, what we did is send out a survey basically to all those that have worked previously to see if they're coming back to give us kind of a baseline. And then we'll be sending out additional, um, I guess, recruitment or solicitations to fill in those extra gaps. 
um, in the event that we find shortages, we are able to work with the county manager's team to um, incorporate HR yeah. to then so, um, yeah. reach out to county employees. But that's, that's, the one, that's, that's, the, that's the group that I'm talking about, that we just need to, um, as opposed to them being polled the day before and said, you will be here tomorrow at 5 a.m., um, uh, can, we, can we get the human resources from the county to start getting a list together of people that want to work the polls? So that you know, so you can just you know go to those people as opposed to, you know, willy nilly, you know, any mini mimo, you're it, yes, and you have to work the poll. So I, we can certainly make that request. Um, but again, the the actions that we're taking right now are hopefully going to alleviate the need to pull at the last minute because we'll have recruitment completed by. Um, a certain cutoff okay. date. All right, I, I'm, I'm just, I get, I get worried about um, the Board of Elections being blamed for things people do that is out of our control um, and it falls back on us. Yes, ma'am. Um, That's being what, that being the problem. I think what Terry's referring to is when human resources is grabbing staff from different departments mm -hmm. um, and we usually go that's usually something that's discussed in the weeks leading up to it. And they try to start grabbing people that are willing to do that. And then we have to wait until towards the end to know where we're going to assign them based on if we have dropouts and those yeah. types of things. I understand that. Well, that's why I'm saying if we you, could, if we could think, get a list. So we've um, also been proactive in reaching out to um, the municipalities to see if they have residents that are interested in working as poll workers. We've also reached out to all of the facilities that we utilize as polling sites to see if they have members of their congregation or staff persons that also want to work. So we are working on those numbers to make sure that we don't have to pull me from you human resources at the last minute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, beginning on slide five. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm sorry, slide four. Um, provided here is a monthly breakdown of staff needed based upon workflow and budget compliance. Um, the spike that you see, for instance, in the month of March um, is due to the, infu uh, the infusion, rather, of advanced voting workers. Um, at, at that time, we'll begin the recruitment and tra training for the 400 plus advanced voting workers. So that's Again, why you kind of see that spike in the month of March. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Next slide, please. Um, so for the May election, we will need the positions listed. And what we've done is provided the temporary <laughs> positions needed for the election cycle. Um, what you see is the area in which the position is needed, the position title, its quantity, and then the, to the right of that, the next column provides the start and projected end date of those each of those assignments. Um, and the last <coughs> excuse me, column gives a summary of what the position will be responsible or working for. Um, for example, the position of couriers under supplies and logistics. Um, <coughs> these positions are responsible for the del delivery of equipment to each site in preparation for both advance voting as well as election day. Um, <coughs> excuse me. On the next slide, another example listed are system specialists who are responsible for the maintenance and preparation of voting equipment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So looking at the dates needed and the responsibilities, please note that these, con these are contractors with specific skill sets that, are, that cannot be replaced through one day volunteers. I just want to make that clear. Um, <clears throat> in the next slide, we provided the same uh, so we've also provided this list for the December and I'm sorry, for the November and December um, elections as well. And so at this point, we would jump down to slide 11. Can I interrupt and ask a question? Uh, on here under the primary election staffing, you have regional coordinator one and regional coordinator two. So we've gone down two people as far as, re I thought we had four regional coordinators. There is a total of um, re four coordinators. Um, there was a distinction, um, I think, through 
um, budget and preparation that they did a classification of uh, regional coordinator one and regional coordinator two, but okay. the total is four, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, so again, beginning uh, going down to slide 11. So as it pertains to getting the needed manpower for the May election, we've ad identified two options. Option A would be to remain with the current staffing agency and, or option B, which would be again to work through the county's HR department to try and fill all of our needed temporary positions. <clears throat> Excuse me. In exploring these two options, the attempt to switch to option B would, um, would come with some identified risk as we believe. Um, the first risk is, um, is that it would be extremely time sensitive. In order to be ready for the May primary election, we would need HR to have staff on, on board at the beginning in um, February. Um, the next risk, risk, excuse me, is that this, is, this undertaking is a labor intensive and would require an e increased resources to recruit and hire the amount of staff needed. The third risk is that there is an increased cost to the county in the range of $2.5 million which does not include the additional cost for the departmental budgets of HR um, purchasing to uh, take on this, um, this lift and, and complete this process. Option B runs the, the risk of the inability to, um, to recruit adequate staff in a timely manner. In the midst of an increase in, co uh, increase in COVID cases, along with a nationwide labor shortage, um, the risk to not have adequate staff in place by a certain time can be detrimental to the department's ability to pr properly conduct the election. The next risk, the inability to separate staff quickly and onboard replacements rapidly is another risk that could severely disrupt um, our ability to be ready for the May election. And then the last risk is the overall size of this task um, to recruit those hundred plus uh, positions. The next Can I just stop you right there? Does anybody mm -hmm. have any questions about this is related specifically to the primary and the, and the primary runoff as, as part of the discussion, right? Yes, ma'am. Everybody good? Okay, continue. On the next slide, um, <clears throat> excuse me. For the November and December elections, we've also identified a set of op options. Again, option B, sorry. Again, option A is to remain with the current staffing agency. Um, option B would be to work through the purchasing department and use the state staffing contracts for other temporary staffing vendors. <clears throat> option C would, again, would be working through the county's um, HR department for all of our staffing needs. So the move to options B and C have risks associated much like the slide before of time, labor, cost increase, the inability to staff in a timely manner. However, with the option to use staffing agent, staffing agent, uh, sorry, state staffing contracts with under, other vendors brings a new risk of the time required to solicit contract with sta other staffing vendors. Um, this process could take anywhere from four to six months. Um, and again, the inability to separate staffing quickly and onboarding replacements and the size of recruitment, again, are risks that have come with the switch to option um, either C or B. <clears throat> Can I Next. ask a question about this slide? Um, what state staffing contracts are you speaking of? I mean, are they similar to, this, to, our, to our current a staffing agency. I'm sorry, ma'am. Can you repeat the question again? Oh, um, you, on option B, you have used state staffing contracts for other temporary staffing vendors. These are already contracts that the that the city or that the county has set up. Correct. To, Correct. So, I, working through purchasing, they would go through the list that um, of vendors who already have approved um, state contracts, and then begin to explore those um, for. 
I guess, a diverse, diversification in the staffing agencies that we are able to use. Okay. Because I'm just wondering if we're using one staffing agency, why would it be hard to use another, you know, other staffing, another staffing agency? Is that a... Um, so I, I believe that in the past there have been multiple staffing agencies. Um, the others have not shown to have the bandwidth to be able to mm -hmm. actually adequately service or, or fulfill the staff that are needed. And would that be the same situation under the current, uh, under uh, using a current state staffing contract? Say it again, please. Would that be the same situation with using under under option B using the state staffing contracts, the, the, the contracts the state already has? Um, well, I guess at this point that's potential risk that we were trying to um, foresee. But again, the 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 intent is to um, resolicit to see those capabilities of other options, basically, um, to then hopefully either move towards or incorporate um, to assist with the staffing for our department. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let me just make an additional comment to that. So my understanding is this isn't an apples apples to apples kind of exchange. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we talked to the purchasing department earlier this week about this because I was privy to this conversation. Um, they would choose from the list of approved state vendors, but then would have to go back out with, you know, the RFP and, you know, and, and try mm -hmm. to determine, A, if any of them want to do this work and if any of them are suitable to do this work. Uh, okay. uh, and that is right, where so you come up with a minimum of four to six months to be able okay. to, to make that change. And then, so, which is why we're talking about exploring those opportunities for the November election, mm -hmm. but not the May election. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Eskridge will go through a little bit more detail about that. Um, there's a willingness to try to do that, but we're trying to mitigate some of the risk of, frankly, it not working right before an election. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 we're, right. making, we're doing a lot of changes here. But we don't want to take all the wheels off the car mm -hmm. right before an election. So, so and some of the if you, I think there are probably five or six staffing agencies within the state con that we could go to with the state contract. If they choose to go outside of that and they want to do a full solicitation um, for companies that are outside the state contract, the price that we're getting through the state contract is gonna go up. Gonna go up. And there, you know, there are, are risks of vendors also that are not going to want to work with us considering the negative publicity that will come along with it. So there, there are a lot of other things to consider because most, you know, mm -hmm. we've I seen think. what's happened to happy faces that same, there are vendors that are going to fear that same mm -hmm. Push back. thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Continue. Um, so, um, reconvening back to slide 13. Um, in exploring the options, we've come up with a list of pros and cons. Uh, the pros of the county outsourcing staff through a state contract, ah, sorry. Um, the pros of the county outsourcing staffing through a state contract provides a fiscal benefit um, to the county. The background checks and drug screening rates are reduced at competitive rates. It offers the flexibility to choose a supplier based upon business needs and best value. And more importantly, it, again, it allows quick access to onboarding of temporary staffing. Um, the cons are concerns which have been provided directly from the HR department. Um, first, the HR department would need additional HR staff along with the budget office and purchasing department that would be solely allocated for elections operations. HR is concerned about the challenge to recruit and onboard staff of over 800 positions. Um, going back to the time sensitive risk, HR would need to have onboarding completed by mid February. Uh, the time it takes to backfill positions is another concern. And lastly, the difficulty to temporary fill call outs due to sick and other leave types. Uh, next slide, please. 
So based upon the needs of the departments, the options available, the concerns of HR staff, we are proposing the following recommendations for consideration from the BOC. Uh, for the 2020 election cycle, we recommend that the request to, and we recommend and request approval to remain with the temporary staffing agency with the full-time permanent staff managing that temporary staff. <clears throat> this would then give us the opportunity to develop a staffing plan with the intent to hire roughly 10% of temporary workers using an internal HR staff for recruitment and hiring functions um, for long-time temporary staff. Remaining with the current staffing agency would also allow us the opportunity to adequate, um, the opportunity in the adequate time to explore the use of other state temporary staffing vendors. Um, and lastly, we'll continue to implement contract management improvement method methodologies, which will help mitigate the uh, concerns over contract renewals in the future. And then in 2023, would, we would revisit the staffing model to source temporary staffing from other state staffing agencies as operationally doable. Um, <clears throat> I do apologize, Ms. Willard. We did update this, so you all do not have the, the uh, latest. That's all right. You go for well. it. Um, <clears throat> so as we continue to improve on internal processes, we plan to take the following steps to improve the department's contract management. The first step would be securing additional procurement training for management. Uh, secondly, we'll implement collaboration touch points with purchasing management and staff to ensure compliance. Um, we'll develop a tracking, a monitoring and uh, contract completion schedule for all departmental contracts and implement an annual schedule for contract renewal spending authority at request to be presented at least 60 days before their expiration. Um, the last slide is our basically our proposed action plan contingent upon BOC approval. So we'll seek approval on next week's meeting on January 19th from the, from the BOC. <clears throat> that would then um, begin a new contract as of February 1st, um, in which we would begin recruitment towards the 800 plus temporary positions needed. Um, by February 4th, we would identify a classification of positions that could be recruited through other states of approved staff, staffing agencies, excuse me. Um, and then next week, we would work through purchasing to research other state approved staffing agencies in order to identify their capabilities and availability to provide temporary staffing for elections. Um, and that is the conclusion, and I'll open the floor up for additional questions. Thank you. Uh, when I start to my right, Mr. Johnson, do you have any questions? I don't know if I have uh, questions as much as I have comments and questions. So I think this whole conversation, while, at, while I do appreciate the staff and the board and everybody trying to make sure we do the best thing by the people of the Fulton County and the voters of Fulton County and being responsible uh, stewards, uh, the hard thing for me is this conversation is really not about what's the best process. It's more about getting rid of happy faces. It's more about um, happy faces being blamed for everything that happened in the 2020 elections. And that's the part that gets me the most. I understand some of the things we all had. Uh, there were all types of levels of problems during the 2020 election that I believe not just uh, happy faces, but the department, COVID, it all played a part in us not having the best elections. But to put it all primarily on happy faces is unfortunate. Now, am I tied to happy faces? Absolutely not. But at the same time, I understand the importance of or the significance of having a temporary agency handle some of the aspects of the process that the county is just simply not equipped to handle. As much as we talk about the county can just do this and the county can just do that, 
uh, the county just simply can't. There's a reason why there's a temporary agency being used. There's a reason why not just Fulton County, but other counties across the state of Georgia use temporary agencies because of the way governments are set up. A lot of times we think that, we think in a private company thought process that we can just hire somebody, fire somebody, get somebody new. Uh, if this person doesn't work out, we can just get rid of them, replace them, and it won't be a problem. But government doesn't work like that. Government has a system, good or bad, government has a system and a process in order to do everything. And hiring is one of those processes that takes a little longer. In a private industry, I can decide today that I want to hire somebody, I can meet them tomorrow, and by the end of the day tomorrow, they can be hired. That process doesn't work like that in government, especially at Fulton County government. There's an advertising, there's a review, there's a full process every time. So in the instance that uh, Rick mentioned before when we had to, or when the department had to, uh, people didn't show up or people, a lot of things happened and people got, uh, needed to be removed. That process is not going to be as easy with Fulton County handling the hiring and firing of everybody as it would be with a temporary staffing agency. But not only that, according to state laws, and in this part, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if a person works so many hours or a person works over a particular time period, they're now considered full-time employees and not temporary employees. I know you can have temp perm and all that other good stuff, but there are laws that are, that are surrounding that, that if Fulton County were to hire people, then they essentially have to find stuff for them to do, not just during elections, but other times throughout the year. So I think we need to look at this from a perspective of what's in the best interest of the county, and not to mention the additional amount of money that it's going to take in order to implement this. And then on top of that, we're talking about doing this at a time where we have a major election coming up. Uh, Dr. Ruth mentioned this earlier, all eyes are gonna be on Fulton County yet again. Uh, during this next election. They're gonna be looking for Fulton County to do good or to do bad. Whatever they're looking for, Fulton County is going to be looked at. So I think as we go into this, we can't go into the mindset that we just gotta get rid of happy faces. Or we can't go into the mindset that we have to do X. The only thing that I think that we should go into the mindset of is doing what's best for the citizens of Fulton County. And I know that's not really a question, but that's just my comment for the moment. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Wingate. Uh, thank you. Um, by what you presented, Mr. Eskridge, it, um, to me, it's you are setting out now and evaluating potential options for staffing. In this year, 2022, we're fundamentally going to have to retain and use happy faces because there's not enough time to do all of this evaluation of options in time to meet the deadlines we have for current election operations. Is that a fair statement? I believe it is, yes, sir. Thank you. So I, I agree with some of the statements, Mr. Johnson, that you made about um, happy faces and I will say that, you know, we did get a report the um, SOS had a monitor, and in the monitor's report, they did recommend in 2020 that we not, that the, that the department not rely so heavily on staffing agencies to staff elections um, because they noted that some of the staff um, weren't very invested in the process. And this, this is not all. I will say, I think over the past year or so, Sharon has worked very closely with um, Mr. Harrison to improve the recruitment process so that we are getting people who are invested in elections. Um, However, there still have been some hiccups that really need to be worked out. So for example, standardizing, if we 
are staying with Happy Faces, standardizing the process. That has not been the case, that there are some staff members that go through the process that's very different from others, and it should be a, a seamless, consistent process. Um, so, you know, I understand the risk. I, I didn't see the risk of remaining with Happy Faces with the current staffing agency. There wasn't a risk proposal for that. Or did I miss that? Um, if I could make one comment yeah. before that, answering that question. So that report also stated that there was not enough middle management to properly supervise um, the amount of temporary staff that we have. Um, during last year, we've increased that amount to um, kind of, as a response to that, we have increased our middle management to then be more equipped to adequately supervise the amount of supplemental staff. Um, <clears throat> the that, That's a good point. I think that should be reflected in here. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> To answer your question um, concerning the risk for staying with, um, from the departmental standpoint, um, we have a model that works. Um, um, although there is concern over the 2020 election, um, last year we've had three elections that were marked as successful with the same staffing model in place. Um, so as far as outlining a, a, um, a list of risk, um, Again, from our standpoint, we're confident that the, the current model that we have works. Mm, my only, um, um, it was a nice presentation, but I do, I do agree with Kathleen, with uh, Dr. Ruth, that the, the risk factors for, um, uh, or the, the, the upside for keeping um, happy faces should be noted in here. As far as the from the recommendation, I don't, I don't, I apparently you all got that before I was on, so I don't, I'm not sure what you were referring to, but I can, I can believe it came from the SOS. So it was a 2020 election, correct? Yes. The um, that's in reference to the technical, the monitor. Uh, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I did not, I did not get that. So if if you all could send me a copy of that, I'd appreciate it so I could read that. Okay, um, uh, but again, as far as what I was, let me refer back to what I was saying before. I know that everybody's trying to find places, uh, 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 new volunteers to work our polls, but in the event, and since it's not going to hurt anything, in the event of sending, having the HR department of Fulton County or asking them to send out a you know sign-up sheet um, for those that are interested in working on uh, at the polls, um, just to have that in our back pocket, uh, I do not think would hurt anything, even if we're trying other avenues, um, because we never know what's going to happen. And I think it would be better to have a list of people from Fulton County that have decided, you know, that have said, yes, I'm willing to work the polls. So if, you know, one day, the day before the elections, they get polled or they get told, you know, or said, you know, we need you to work a poll that it doesn't cause a lot of angst, which I think um, people being pulled from their jobs without agreeing to work on a poll um, causes a lot of angst. So it's just so kind of being proactive. So you've heard complaints about that? Is yes. that why you're yes. addressing that? Okay. Yes. So I just, think it's, I just think it's something to be proactive about. I mean, it never hurts to have more names. So just ask, you know, ask, um, you know, the, the, the employees of Fulton County you know, here's a sign-up list. If you want to work the polls, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, and we need you, you know, sign up, and we'll, and you know, if we need you, we'll call you. Yes, we'll send out a survey to Fulton County employees this week. We'll okay. do that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I, w I would further suggest maybe that we might want to communicate with our colleagues over at the City of Atlanta and some of the other jurisdictions to see if they have employees that would like to be deployed to work on election mm -hmm. day. Right, we did, we did send out an email to the city clerks um, and we're awaiting their response by January 18th. Perfect, thank you. Um, Mr. Eskridge, thank you for this. Let me, I want to just set a little bit more context and I'll have some, just a little bit of feedback I can give to you privately on, on sort of that one slide. Um, so what we're doing right now uh, is 
kind of previewing <laughs> what the Board of Commissioners will see at the commissioners meeting next week as they discuss, and staff, correct me if I'm wrong, as they discuss the renewal of the Happy Faces contract uh, for the work that we need to go forward. There have been a lot of internal discussions. I participated in a meeting that um, the county manager and some of his senior staff participated in as, and, and with the election staff as we were um, discussing, you know, what would we do if we tried to use somebody else and how would we do it and what would that work like to, 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 to summarize very quickly internally, uh, our HR team, our procurement team, and the team that, you know, cuts the checks uh, said they, they just simply can't do this, right? Um, they might be able to, we might be able to sliver off some very small number that they could help us with in some specific capacity, but um, it would require quite a, quite a boost in the number of staff that they have and that, you know, boost the equipment and blah, 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 blah. So it's just not an appropriate thing to channel through our HR department. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, you know, there's always things that we can do to improve on, but the current vendor is one that we have worked with, understands our processes, understands our needs, um, and, and continue to work with staff to address when things don't go as well as we'd like them to go. Um, but generally speaking, mm -hmm. if you'll recall, this last two elections in this last year went quite well. Mm -hmm. And even the general election, even though it was quite a lift in 2020, was difficult. I'll, I'll spare us an in-depth discussion of my opinion of the primary, but I think there were lots of reasons why that didn't go well. Um, so wh what we started discussing yesterday was I think everybody is open to exploring whether there is a way to, um, uh, what's the word I want to say, um, but both, you know, seek additional vendors mm -hmm. and see what can happen, but also sort of layer in, maybe there's certain specialties that one vendor can do and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. By doing that, of course, you run the risk that you've got even more management that you have to do by going to separate vendors to get that done. Mm -hmm. But our procurement department um, is, is going to go back to the state list and start the discussion about what that might look like, whether there are vendors on the state contract that would like to work with us, and you know, with an eye that will continue this discussion uh, toward the general election. But the recommendation of, of the, the sum of the staff at the county, not just the election staff, is that we would proceed now uh, as we have for the primary election in order to get going. Because if you look at that staffing chart, we, starting now, we're gonna be adding tens of hundreds of, you know, of employees to be ready for the, the primary election and the work we have to do. So um, that's gonna be the recommendation is that we do that while we explore toward the primary of doing some layering in. Again, not a wholesale revisiting for the general, because frankly, we don't think there's enough time to do that either, mm -hmm. um, but to, to see what the possibilities are and to move forward and work with that. So I'm hoping that what we'll see next week is that the Board of Commissioners will approve this so we can move on, um, and, and then we'll you know continue to have discussions as information gets revealed. So I think it's very important that we distinguish that this, we don't want this to be, um, happy faces as it was that, you know, I, I like what you said, uh, Mr. Eskridge, about the importance of putting in middle management throughout the process. And I think that's important. That's different from the way that we've engaged or that the department has engaged in, with happy faces before. We need more oversight embedded in happy faces from the department to ensure consistency across the board and also that we're selecting the right people. Um, I know that Happy Faces incorporated some um, skills um, that they had individuals to do that took like for some individuals three hours, some individuals didn't have to do that. We really just need, we, it's really important that we have that consistency. That's my concern. Thank you for that. And I will also say again, there is a request for I believe 13 additional employees 
that would fill some of the positions that we're requesting temporarily that are employees that we could keep busy year round in, in the function that has not been put forward for approval by the Board of Commissioners. And then, you know, that that that's the challenge, right? We have this, again, election department. We all want to do better. We all want to have process improvements and do things. Um, but then, you know, when we kind of get strangled on the back end of the mm -hmm. resources that are needed to make those improvements, um, you know, it, 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 it can be incredibly frustrating to, to all involved, right? And nobody wants to have employees where you say, we really want you to improve, but we're not going to help you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what we want to, you know, try to be thoughtful about. And so I appreciate um, the work that went in to really sort of laying this out. Um, and we'll, we'll see how it works um, going forward. But again, people want to talk to their board of commissioners you know, approving the budget that we've requested, which does not have a lot of extra, um, mm -hmm. is, is how you begin to chip away at the need for the, um, the temporary employees that, again, may not be as bought in day to day um, or may have concerns, right? We have a COVID, you know, you know uh, wave and everybody's kids go home from school and suddenly you've got temporary employees who have got to stay home. Right, they got to stay home with their kids and do their thing, or they're or they're not well. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have challenges in this time that continue. But thank you for that. I won't belabor the point. Um, if there's any other discussion or comments, uh, my only comment would be, uh, Madam Chair, is that can I look at this uh, and, and send you and see if I have any more recommendations? I really didn't get a whole lot of time to look at the presentation thoroughly. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Eskridge, oh, appreciate you. you. And uh, like I said, I'll, uh, let's just talk right after the meeting. I want to just point out a couple things that might help or might not help, who knows. All right, time for the voter challenge hearing. How shall we proceed with this? I'll let the staff uh, lead us. Are we gonna call up the people with the challenges in order? Um, or are we gonna let you present yeah. it? How, how shall we go? We'll have them come up in order. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask um, David Hill Hubert to come forward, please. Uh, I believe you have 403 voters challenged, and I'll let you uh, give us a couple of minutes of explanation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you have on the challenges that I've made, predominantly in Florida of people who've moved from the county to Florida and registered to vote there. So all, so all of the voters that you're challenging have registered to vote in Florida? That's correct. And were previously registered to vote here? That's correct. Okay. So in the findings, um, good afternoon, well, good morning. In the findings um, that were submitted by Mr. Um, David Hubert, there were a total of 403 electors being challenged today. Um, the registrar's recommendation is to remove um, the 400, 403 electors. If you take a look at the findings report, 348 of them are currently already in the inactive status as far as the NCOA um, process or cross state status. And 55 of those are active in Fulton County but they, um, we were able to verify that they are currently reg registered in the state of Florida. So we recommend removal. We're on David. Um, this oh, is Florida. in the first one, my mistake, Mr. Johnson, thank you. That in the 348, that state was supposed to be Florida. So I have it corrected in the 55, but not in the 348. I'll correct that. So you're, I'm sorry. Yeah, just could you clarify your, um, your recommendation, please, again? The recommendation is for the board to approve the removal of the 403 electors submitted by Mr. David okay. Hill Hubert. Thank, right, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, would you tell me what the... Recommendations are written on the backside of um, 
Okay. All right, would somebody want to make a motion? Yeah. I make a motion to um, remove the 403 uh, electors being challenged by Mr. Hubert. Is there a second? A second. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. Okay, we will remove those electors from voter rolls. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next person would be uh, Earl Ferguson, 170 voters challenged. Madam Chair and uh, members of the board, I'm here to challenge uh, using a 229 section challenge of the voters that uh, re were resident and registered in Atlanta or in Fulton County who have moved to the state of North Carolina and are registered there. Um, I was prepared to give you more introductory, but uh, apparently, I, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but I'm, I'm going to skip some of the introductory material about how we got here. But we used the uh, post office's um, change of address list augmented by uh, our, our own uh, Georgia registration number and, and date of birth added to that. We started out with 420 North Carolina folks. We, uh, we have eliminated uh, a lot of them because they didn't register to vote in North Carolina and we came up with this number. Now there are a few left uh, that will be back for in February. <clears throat> the ones that I presented uh, last time and today are are ones that I think are, are not questionable uh, but there are some judgments involved and if you have someone who uh, uses a post office box as their address when they do the, the uh, change of address form and then uh, they show up you want to see that they've shown up somewhere close to that and uh, sometimes there's some judgment and, and I'll, I'll uh, identify some of those at the next meeting. And that's about all I think I need to say at the point there are questions. I'll... Nope, I think, I, oh, okay. I want to clarify something just for my own understanding. You said if somebody registers with the post office box, they should show up somewhere near that post office box? <laughs> when they file their change of address, they use a post office box. Mm -hmm. They cannot register using the post office box, right. obviously. But, uh, you know, in in 90% uh, or better, uh, they know where they're going to live when they move, so that makes it fairly easy. If they use a post office box, then we're just a little bit more careful when the registration comes in to make sure that that uh, address is somewhere close to that post office box. I think we're going to have to do some. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I thought you were finished. Go ahead and finish. I apologize. I thought you were finished. I'm sorry. Did I answer your question? Yes. But unfortunately, I'm going to have to disagree with you because you have a lot of people that move into a city. They move into Atlanta. They move to wherever. And they get the first post office box that they can find. And a lot of people maintain that post office box for a considerable amount of time. And I'll use myself as an example. Uh -huh. I came here, I was right down the street, and I had a post office box that wasn't too far from here, but then I ended up moving out to Stone Mountain, and I maintained that post office box because it was convenient. It, I didn't have to go through the process again, even though I got certain mail, but I just think we're going to have to have a higher bar than they don't live close to the post office mm -hmm. box, but thank you. Okay. I make a motion to... Uh, wait, 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 let's hear from Ms. Marshall. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. So provided the findings brought forth by Mr. Ferguson, I recommend removing the um, 100, 170 electors from the voter rolls. And may I ask a question? Do, I re recall um, last month there was a, one voter that we held off. Did you re 
He, he has been, yes. He's on this list, yes. Okay, great. And I also wanted to mention that um, in doing our research this time, Mr. Johnson um, had the question last month about whether or not the electors had military designations. So in doing our research, none of these people, even though it's maybe near the military base, none of them are um, on the military list. So we just wanted to be sure we were not counseling people, as you stated, that may be in the military or you know, traveling back and forward. Nor college. Yeah, that question came up last time. I didn't I do a college, it, but I'll check that. But no, no military designation. Um, we'll have to try to pull some type of report to see what for, what area um, the addresses may fall in, but we did not do the research in accordance with the college, but just the military base. But you are confirming that each person was registered in Georgia and at some point they registered in North Carolina. Yes, sir, and Mr. Ferguson provided great proof. Um, and we were also able to look at the My Voter page, election net, and bump it up against the um, proof that Mr. Ferguson provided to our office. So yes, sir, they are currently registered in both states. And this morning, about four people reached out to us from his challenge to say that they are North Carolina residents. So our letters did touch the public. Okay. I just want to thank you, Ms. Marshall, for the great job that you're doing, the investigative work that your department is doing. It's really important, and thank you for that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay. I apologize for jumping forward. No, that's all right. I, I, you I can was, make the motion I, now. I already, I, already read, I already read her summarization, so it was like, I apologize. Um, I make a motion to uh, remove the 170 um, uh, electors being challenged by Mr. Um, Ferguson. Is there a second? Second. Carefully moved and seconded. All those in favor of removing these electors from the rolls, please say aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. They're removed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, moving on. Uh, Christine Probst has uh, moved to challenge 20 electors. She wants to come forward and talk to us about that. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, Can just speak right in there. Yep. Okay, so I have only 20 voters, and uh, it was from the National Change of Address uh, compared to those who are uh, registered here. And of the 20, 14 are inactive. They're from lots of different states. The process I went through was to first confirm that they are showing on the Georgia Secretary of State's uh, My Voter page. So I have a screenshot for each one that shows they are indeed still um, on the rolls in Georgia. And then I went to the um, state election site for their new address and captured a screenshot of that to show that they are registered in the, at the location of the address that they have moved to. And in some cases, like with North Carolina, you can actually see um, that they have voted in their new state. So, there might be some overlap, Ms. Marshall, with, um, for the North Carolina voters. I don't know if you checked that or not, but I was looking at uh, precinct SS09B and SS09A in uh, Fulton. That was the list that I started with. Any questions? No, thank you. Ms. Marshall. Provided the findings brought forth by Ms. Cross, I recommend removing the 20 electors from the voter rolls. Okay, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Just curious, you said one of the things that you mentioned that was in North Carolina, you have the ability to see if people had voted. Of the people from North Carolina, did all of them or any of them vote? Yes. Um, let's take a look. Glasses. I use them too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's bad. Okay, so I have three North Carolina voters on my list. And all three of them have okay. voted. Okay, thank you. Sure. And so I have a question. The last five five people um, on the list all last voted in Georgia last January, I guess, in the in the runoff. Um, mm -hmm. How have we determined that they uh, have moved and aren't intending to vote this year? Okay, so you're talking about the last five voters on my list. Mm -hmm. So this is from the national change of address, right? So they've submitted a permanent address change. And then if you go to the election site, so for instance, let's take um, Mark Weathers. If you go to the uh, Oregon election website and put in the information, you will see 
that he is registered in Oregon and he is in an active status. So those are the two things that I checked. Oh, yeah. So would you, so similarly, um, for the people who last voted in Georgia last January, that's the same scenario then? You used an example of somebody who'd been gone longer. Yeah. Oh, okay. See what I'm saying? Like if you right. bump to the last, like Roger Lee Feldman. Sorry. So I couldn't actually see if they voted um, in the last, last election from the MVP mm -hmm. page. All I can see is that they're currently active or in it, what their status was. So I wouldn't be able to see their voter history on the MVP oh, page. If but we are. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. but so sure we were able can. to, yes. So we were able to verify the um, election last voted in Georgia and bump it up against the current registration in the out of state. So if they were active, for example, in Oregon and active in Georgia, the last time they voted here may have been 2021, but they recently, well, in January of 2021, but they registered in May of 2021 and they have voted there as well. So once you are in active status and voting somewhere else, then we can remove them. Great, thank you. Appreciate that explanation. I, so, I figured there was an explanation. I just couldn't figure it out on my own. Thank you, Mr. So Johnson. So that sparks another question. So you were able to see exactly, all right, these last, on this particular page, the last five people all voted uh, <clears throat> January 5th, 2021. And then you have a date registered in a new state. So that's 315, 929. They're all after 1, 5, 21. Yes. So my question to you is, wouldn't this get caught anyway when we do, when, yes. when the rolls are cleaned up? So as Mr. Barron stated earlier, and within those um, about 56,000 NCOAs that we just currently mailed out, more than likely these people are going to be, you know, they are receiving a um, NCOA confirmation. So it will get caught during the list maintenance that our office is currently doing. Um, so even if it has not been caught yet and the challengers were able to do research and bring it forth, forth more than likely they will receive it in COA because we had about, I don't know the exact number of them, of the NCOAs that are actually cross state. So there's quite a bit. So yes, it will be called caught anyway. before the primary. So how often do we do that process? Every list maintenance for the NCOA confirmation is usually every two years. So now we're almost being required to do a process that the state has been doing every two years, we're now going to have to do it almost every month or even every time a person puts forth a challenge. Yes, because they have that right, yes, sir. Okay. Um, but we did want to mention um, in this meeting today, and I have to get with Ms. Cheryl first to send it to her to just basically get the correct verbiage for me. There will be a deadline for submitting the challenges because we see that people are starting to submit those to us. Um, it's about 90 days out of the primary election. So actually I was telling Ms. in conversation with Mr. Ferguson, letting him know that um, once I get the correct answer that the last time, well, the last meeting in February will be the last time to bring forth the challenge until after the election. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The other thing that I did was I asked Shamira to put together an information sheet that we can end up posting on the website that ta that allow people that are interested in doing these voter challenges, they can go there, they can have a resource of what, what they need to do. And then based on, you know, the, the three individuals here today and Shamir's work with Mr. Ferguson too, just so that people know when best to send these lists to us to coincide with our monthly meetings so that we don't have to have special meetings to take care of this. I mean, that's, that's helpful if, if um, challengers want to bring those to time them for our monthly meetings as well. But th and this is the second NCOA mailing in what, the last six months, Shamira? Yes, I sir, it is. And there was also the no activity mailing. So the, in, in 2020, it was difficult for the Secretary of State to initiate these because of all of the federal elections. And there's basically, there was a, a blackout period. And so once that 
passed in 2021, they started doing these mailings and they're doing one again ahead of this primary. Great, thank you. Okay, um, but we need a motion. Thank you for your patience. We need a motion. Would somebody make a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion to accept the, I don't have a number. In 20. 20. The 20, the 20 challenges um, uh, to be removed. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, do we have a need to go into executive session? Ms. Ringer, do we need to go into executive session about legal matters? Okay. Anybody else need to go into an executive session? Okay. We will not go into executive session. I can entertain a motion to adjourn. Anybody want to second? second? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.